our next uh, guest speaker is the uh, one of the co-conspirator co-conspirators who helped uh, design this this event. Uh, Captain Van Droff is our third Naval Academy alum to speak today. He is the current <laughs> CEO of NSWC Carter Rock. All right, we've had our fun today. It's time for the serious stuff. And I'm a little disappointed. I, I extracted a pledge from Congressman Gallagher before he left that he would watch this on YouTube because I'm up here to talk about everyone's favorite topic, the reason you all came here today, acquisition reform. <laughs> now that's very topical in the news. You know, we, the House and Senate just passed the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, a lot of Congressman Thornberry's reform activities were there because we need to do better than the previous administration in defense acquisition. Uh, but of course, I was doing defense acquisition during the previous administration, the Obama administration, and then Secretary Kendall, the undersecretary and the administration, the Congress back then said, well, we need to do acquisition much better than we did in the Bush administration. Uh, I was doing acquisition in the Bush administration. We said, we have to do, we have to reform what we did in the Clinton administration. I was there in the Clinton administration doing acquisition reform where they said, well, the Cold War is over, so we need to reform acquisition because we have to do it much better. So it's been going on. So I did a little research to say, how long has acquisition reform really, the efforts been going on? And it dates back quite a ways. Maestro, if you would play, please. There's more. <laughs> it's going a little fast to read, but I'll summarize. <laughs> now if I could have my slides, please. So I'm going to look at the program, the Death Star program, right, which was started in the years leading up to the Battle of Yavin by the Galactic Empire, uh, and what their acquisition reform efforts were like in the Death Star program. And I'm going to see what do we, can, what do we have in the way of successes, failures, and lessons learned. So that slide, please. OK, so the first thing, and I draw heavily on actual real acquisition reform. So in the modern day, in the 2009, during the, at the National Defense Authorization Act, a section of that legislation that goes by the name was SAR, Weapon Systems Acquisition Reform Act, created an office in the Secretary of Defense that said their job was whenever a program goes kablooey, right? Whenever it has a nun McCurdy breach, it goes way over budget or completely fails to deliver the capability it's supposed to, a group of experts to go look at and say what went wrong. Secretary Kendall, the uh, acquisition executive in the Obama administration, actually expanded their charter in a, in a very smart way. He said, don't just look at programs when they fail, also look at programs when they succeed, and let's see what we can learn from that. So if you read, the, and the office goes by the acronym PARCA, right? So if you read the PARCA reports, you can see, so I took a page from PARCA and said, okay, what went right in the Death Star program, and then what were their challenges, and what can we learn from that? So the first thing that the Death Star got right, that in any DOD publication today you would find is, do you have good requirements flow down? All right, are you building the thing that meets your needs? So we start from the policy goals received from political leadership. As one of my previous panelists said, what's the policy goal? We're dissolving the Senate. It's our goal to rule without a Senate, we're going to rule without any kind of representation of all of these diverse planets. Well, how are we going to do that? All right, now when the senior military leadership, by the way, that's, as everyone knows, Grand Moff Tarkin. And I always thought that the senior military officer in an organization should have a title different from all the others. I, I, I think that we call General Dunford the chairman general, but that's, he's a four star just like all the other four stars. I think Grand Moff uh, Dunford has a great ring to it. Maybe Congressman Gallagher will take that up in the next year's NDAA, establishing that rank. So Tarkin comes up with 
the military implementation of the political strategy, which is we need fear to keep the systems in line. Because we have to maintain a navy full of big star destroyers to be ready to engage in battle, there's no way we can constabulary everything. We bankrupt ourselves. So what we need to be able to do is blow up planets that piss us off. <laughs> right? That's a requirement. Those requirements then become the technical specifications that a program manager, the hero of our story, Orson Krennic, right, who is the hero of Rogue One, forget Jen Urso and all that, they're right, the hero is, is the program manager who's trying to deliver on a major acquisition program for their customer. Right? He's got to do that. So the first thing is, yes, the Empire got this right. They had a meaningful flow down of requirements that made sense. Given their strategic goals, Death Stars made sense. They had the requirements specced out correctly. Next. OK. The next thing that Parker looks at is, did you have the right leadership involvement in your program? Now here, you've got to credit Palpatine. He did a very wise thing, right? He took a very senior member of his administration the Undersecretary for Sith Affairs, right? <laughs> the former Anakin Skywalker, now Lord Vader, right? And put him in charge, making it an ACAT 1D program, a Darth <laughs> Acquisition Reporting Program, right? Now we talk about force, right? I have a little pull from the movie here, as in the middle of a defense acquisition, or I should say a Darth Acquisition Board, in the middle of a Darth Acquisition, the acquisition executive starts to choke, force choke the program manager. <laughs> because of a problem that the user created, right? What was the problem? It was, it, was, it, was, it was Tarkin who goes and decides to blow up the moon there where all the kyber crystals are. Uh, the, the, uh, now I'm mind blanking on the name of that moon. Uh, Jetta, Jetta, right, he goes and blows up Jetta and, and the leadership is, is not happy about that. But just because your user has screwed up is no reason not to choke the program manager. Now, I was a major program manager in DOD <laughs> for five years. I was a deputy major program manager for the two years before that, so I had seven years in senior program leadership. I had two different acquisition executives at the Navy level, the Honorable Sean Stackley, and at the defense level, it was the Honorable Frank Kendall. I am here to tell you that at no point did either one of them choke me during any of the dabs that I briefed them on. That doesn't mean they didn't want to choke me. <laughs> But again, we have good oversight here. We have the senior political <laughs> leadership in the empire is actively involved in this project. So that's, that's good too. So we have a couple of good things here for the Death Star as an acquisition program. Next slide. We have some challenges, the kind of challenges that you find in a lot of programs. So what you have here is, <laughs> right, you have the user community one that wants to take early ownership of the project, that is dismissive of what the technical and acquisition pro community is telling them, doesn't really want to hear about the downside, just wants to say, hey, I got planets to blow up, let's go, time's ticking, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, you have a PM that's a little overprotective of his, pro of his project, right? He wants, you know, he wants to keep it right here and keep testing it and all, you know, even though the user community needs it. So we've got the user community, the warfighter, and the program manager are not in sync. They are, they are completely out of sync, and that friction is one of the key problems in the Death Star program. Next slide. Okay, getting and maintaining a motivated technical team. Right. They never told me at Defense Acquisition University that I could kidnap my ship design manager's family and hold them hostage. Not saying that I would have, but early on in, in my time as the DDG-51 program manager, when I first got there, I had what I considered the very best ship design manager, an absolutely brilliant engineer who, and where, so Sal's going to freak out when I say this, who early into the Flight 3 design effort, the, uh, I get a call from the Senior Executive Service uh, SES uh, civilian who runs ship design for NAVC. It's like, yeah, I need to send him to the LCS program. And it's like, you're gonna get a new one. It's like, and, and I didn't occur to me, all I did was say, well, can I get a really good engineer? And I got a great one in replacement, so I'm not, no knock on the replacement, but it was a little crestfallen there at the time. I realize now, after seeing Rogue One, I should have just kidnapped their family. Right? 
Should have kidnapped the family, right? And then, and then it's like, that now you work for me, right? Nothing bad will happen to, to, to the kid, right? So that's, that, but seriously, recruiting and maintaining a strong technical team is part of that because that talent, even if they, one, don't believe in the mission, still there are other priorities. So next slide. Okay, supply chain management. Right, and we heard earlier, one of the previous panels was talking about rare earth elements and the need to protect rare earth elements. Well, nothing is rarer than kyber crystals, right? They only exist one or two places in this whole galaxy. We think, I think we'll find out more in December when episode when Last Jedi comes out, but I think we're gonna find out that they're actually sentient. These little kyber crystals are force sensitive and they have personalities, so they don't like being stuck in the center of Death Stars in order to focus all of this energy. Uh, but, you know, you get to, to do that. Uh, actually, my bumper sticker here went away because it's supposed to stay down there. The great quote there that the strongest stars have hearts of Kyber is supposed to be there at the, at the bottom. But so if you want great performance, you might have to use very unique materials to get that performance. Remember what we're talking about here. I'm not going to build a constabulatory navy, even though, you know, Commander Armstrong says I should build a constabulatory navy. So I got to maintain order somewhere. I got to be able to blow up planets. If I gotta blow up planets, I need the kyber crystals, no matter how hard they are to, to get, that poses a vulnerability because now your enemy knows where to strike. I don't know of any other navies that might have fragile industrial supply chains today. <laughs> I don't, right? But maybe over a beer afterwards, I could think some of <laughs> Last one, cybersecurity and data at rest, All right? So, at the end of Rogue One, I immediately went to the leadership of Star Wars. And those people know me, I'm the CEO of, of Card Rock. Uh, we are actually the Navy's version of the planet where this takes place, right? All the ship records and ship design records we have at Card Rock without the benefit of force shields, with no palm trees, I don't have a division of stormtroopers protecting it, I just have a safe and a lock, right? And a, you know, and a, and a vault. Uh, but if your data, here's the problem, if you're in a program, your data is valuable, and your enemies will try and get your data, and if your enemy gets your data, it will have potentially disastrous consequences. So that was a challenge here. Bad cybersecurity turned out to be a really bad challenge, you know, effect for the Death Star. So slide. So how do we rate the Death Star overall, <laughs> but the goods, the bads? What you, what you have to take away is, is that in one sense, it absolutely worked, right? <laughs> Krennic was able to deliver to his warfighter a transformational capability. The ability, Alderaan was toast at the beginning of, <laughs> of that's all right, boom, right? There it went, right? We accomplished the mission. A transformational weapon system. Now, because it was so transformational, you had a susceptible and fragile supply chain, and that became a problem. Because Grand Moff Tarkin didn't give Krennic any time to do test and evaluation, the whole design fact, the fact, I mean, adequate t &E would have caught that design flaw. But because of that, you know, we had to field for a G1. For those of you who don't speak de uh, Department of Defense ease, that's a joint urgent operational need, G1, <laughs> right? I got it, it's the, it's, the, it's the joint speak of, I gotta go blow up Alderaan, I gotta blow it up right now. <laughs> In the end, you had a poorly motivated technical team and that led to design flaws that were not uncovered during the t &E phase. And ultimately, and I can't stress this too strongly, right? The Empire's flawed strategic vision <laughs> cannot be overcome by acquisition achievements. You cannot buy your way out of bad strategy, right? Was, right, so the strategy back is, let's do away with the Senate, right? And the idea behind the, the Empire was, I can buy myself, if I buy a, a cool enough weapon, I can buy my way out of a flawed strategy. And the, the ultimate answer here is, no, you can't. If your strategy doesn't make sense, it doesn't matter what you buy. So the, as a program, right, I rate Krennic and the Death Star program, I give it high marks, right? In my mind, this gets the, whatever the equivalent of a David Packard award is in the Galactic Empire for outstanding program. But the strategic planning of Palpatine and Vader that's what loses the day. So that's what ends up there. They can't overcome their flawed strategic vision. Thank you very much for your attention.